record. Hi everyone, this is Ricky Spencer and welcome to the Sociology of Media series. And today we have Jason Parlow Tellis and they are a cultural doctoral research student at the School of Media, Film and Journalism, Faculty of Arts, Monash University in Australia. He holds a Master of Arts in Media Studies Broadcasting a degree and a BA in Communication degree from the University of the Philippines. He teaches units in Communication, Media Studies, Broadcast Communication and Journalism at the University of the Philippines Baguio as an assistant professor. His research interests are media history, sports media, Indigenous media studies, eco media studies and Southeast Asian media. He is also the current executive director of the South East Asian Media Studies Association. He is the main editor of the book Environment, Media and Popular Culture in Southeast Asia, which he co-authored with John Charles Ryan and Jekrenaya Lewis uh, Drishbash and was published in 2022 by Springer. There were some hard words for me to pronounce there, but welcome, Jason, welcome. Oh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Wow, what an incredible journey. I mean, I just looked at the book and I thought, I don't think I've ever seen a book that has focused on echo media. So can you tell us what is echo media? Well, echo media is essentially the forms of media that um, tell us or exhibit different representations of the environment, maybe through the news, or maybe through music videos or, or comic strips or any form of media, actually. Yeah. And tell me, how did you become interested in this area? Um, first and foremost, I became interested in, the, in this area because um, I am an environmental advocate. Mm -hmm. I, I advocate for the, um, what do you call this? for the preservation, conservation of the environment, especially now in the um, era of environmental destruction and climate change. Mm. So I'd like to study how the environment has been represented in different forms of media, just like the news and documentaries, because most of my research is about documentaries and some other forms of media. So because um, I believe that the media is a powerful tool to increase the awareness of people on environment and different environmental risks and environmental destruction um, across the globe. So I have the advocacy of um, just studying this and exposing the different misrepresentations that can be um, that can be given attention to so that it will not happen again, those kinds of mis misrepresentations. And tell us um, the focus in, in Southeast Asia. How has the, um, the development of, of its um, positioning in the media, how has it changed that you have seen in the last, say, 20 to 30 years? Um, I don't want to pretend to be an expert for the whole Southeast Asia. Um, we had um, different contributors from different countries to talk about that. But um, I, at least in my own opinion or in my own assessment of uh, the Philippines and some other countries as well, um, the focus on the environment is relatively, um, what do you call this, small mm -hmm. in terms of media coverage and the news. And most of the time, if we're going to uh, what they call this, you're going to cover about the environment in Philippine news, for example. It's just about the celebration of different events like the Earth Day or just um, some updates about the projects of the government, about the environment. And there's no re real or deep analysis of the issues that's, that are hounding the environment in the Philippines right now. Mostly it's through documentaries, but even then documentaries have different angles that are sometimes problematic and sometimes are not that accurate when it comes to the representation of different aspects of the environment. 
um, also, I have seen that even the representations of the environment in different forms like films, music videos, um, there is some sort of unethical practices when it comes to portraying the animals, for example, or the seas that are need to be addressed um, at present time. And one thing that I have found interesting um, looking at this idea in Australia is that there's been a lot of conjecture in terms of the influence of government um, in how it sort of sees its role in, in looking after the environment. And in Australia, uh, we have a real deep, um, sometimes a connection because our Indigenous history uh, is one of that was um, one of colonialism, where we destroyed a lot of our natural environments. And there has been a complex relationship that's been covered in, in, in film over the years, trying to sort of unpack that. Have you sort of noticed that there is a shift in people understanding that it's, it's like beyond political, that it's something that needs to be addressed regardless of political ideology? Again, I'm going to speak for the Southeast Asian part and not the Australian part. Um, I think um, there is some sort of shift, but it's not that um, big so far. Um, it's still focused on the political side and even the e economic side. But when it, in terms of our spiritual connections with the environment, it's not really that being focused on. Um, but uh, there are forms of media, just like indig indigenous media in the Philippines, that um, really portray the environment as co-equal with the, with the people in the indigenous communities, like the Igorots of the Northern Philippines. And that's also part of my research, actually, and I've published some research about that. And it's very, what do you call this? It's very disappointing that these kinds of worldviews are being othered or being neglected in the mainstream. So it's one of also one of my advocacies to expose this kinds of um, ideologies and mentalities and even thoughts and ideas so that in the uh, in the formulation of environmental policies and environmental um, environmental what they call this um, policies and suggestions for the for the improvement of our treatment of the environment, I think um, these kinds of worldviews should be put into consideration for a more context appropriate and more um, respectful kinds of policies for different communities and different um, contexts as well. Mm. And what I, I remember reading something um... Uh, and I was watching a documentary on the Philippines about um, the previous history of the uh, Marcos regime and how mm -hmm. <laughs> the part about the, um, I remember there was the animals that they had got in from Africa to put into um, various, they were talking about Nate, people who were natural inhabitants of a particular area in the Philippines, that they were sort of forced to move so these animals could be put into a type of a zoo enclosure. Do, do things like that occur still within the Philippines where you have uh, land degradation and, and I guess, dare I say, exploitation of, uh, of animals being put into spaces? Yes, um, that's um, it's evident in zoos and aquariums in the metro, metro, metropolis of the Philippines. And um, it's also um, evident in different parts, even in the ur rural parts of the Philippines, because most um, green spaces and even those who inhabit those green spaces are not really uh, given much attention and much um, prominence in terms of the discussion of environmental policies. Mm. So that's also a problem. And just to add to the problems as well, 
even the displacement of indigenous peoples are continuing until this day in the pursuit of just mm, um, producing more dams mm. in, near the near the places where indigenous peoples reside right now. And another example is in 2019 when one of the stadiums of the Philippines were construct was constructed for the Southeast Asian Games, um, one of the mega sports events in Southeast Asia. Um, an indigenous group has been displaced for the construction of such a stadium. So it still continues until now. Must make it really difficult, Jason, when you hear these things that are occurring in, in your native country. Is it complicated because of the value of land in the Philippines that I guess those that own land within different areas, it's still a very much a financial, um, one of the issues that's sort of difficult to really unpack the fact that land is so highly prized in the Philippines by those that own yeah. it? Yeah, uh, yes, it's connected to issues on land and property. And it's also connected to how we treat indigenous peoples in the Philippines, um, because they have been lo have long been othered and neglected by the imperial powers that colonized us mm. before, and even during the, uh, during this time, and the government um, don't really give much attention to those communities and even the environment of those communities. Mm. Your book that you spent quite a bit of time um, putting together, was there anything that you found that you were surprised in putting this uh, really important um, works together? That's something that you thought, oh, that you weren't expecting? Um, one, one article or one chapter that I was really surprised was the chapter by John Charles Ryan about um, the, what do you call this, the, I forgot what flower that is, but it's, it's a Titan Arum, by the way. It's a Titan Arum, it's a Southeast Asian plant that's very pungent, mm -hmm. but it's um, widespread in, in Southeast Asia, and how he analyzed the different um, times when the Titan Arum was subject to a time lapse, if you know that in, it's a staple in documentaries about um, plants and animals when they show the growth of the animals in just seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a time lapse. Um, and uh, I, this is the first time that I saw an analysis like that, that it's been, it's seen as um, a form of othering of plants and a form of just making them a subject instead of um, in treating them as um, co-equal with animals and, and even us as human beings and so on. So that's very surprising. And I was even surprised uh, in the different chapters about memes of fish mm -hmm. that I actually wrote and the use of music to, to represent the different struggles of not only fisher folk in the Philippines, but also in... Um, in other places in Southeast Asia. Mm. And what sort of, what messaging do you hope that young people say in the Philippines? Is, there, is it like we have in Australia at the moment where there appears that young people are more aware of what's happening to the environment and are, are real conscious that they wanna make a, a change? Is this happening as well within, from what you could gather in the Philippines? Yeah, it's happening, and um, it's because of social media. So that's one of the um, positive uh, influences of social media right now. We become more aware, and the youth, since they are more of a, uh, what do you call this, uh, visual generation, and they're more adept in using social media, unlike us, the millennials, and earlier generations, um, they have now the uh, ability to be exposed to different um, issues that are usually not covered by the mainstream media. 
So that's one of the good effects of social media right now. And where do you hope, um, I guess it's probably difficult, but say in the next 30 years, where do you see what's gonna what's happening at the moment in the Philippines in terms of um, from what you can see with your research, where do you, where do you see um, the progress going? Mm. So my research is focused on the representation of the environment. So if I were to predict somehow what will happen based on the current events, I think there's a gradual acknowledgement of the different perspectives of human nature relationships and uh, the treat uh, the proper treatment of the environment. So hopefully in the next um, decades that are coming, the representations and portrayal will be more um, diverse and not just focused on the political and economic um, dimensions. And hopefully they will also focus on the social cultural impact of mm -hmm. different environmental issues, environmental policies, and even the our treatment of the environment as a whole. Do you find that um, as you go to different places within the Philippines that there is change happening around you in little ways? Or do we still have to kind of deal with what's happened in the past and we're still dealing with the ramifications in the way the land has been um, sort of taken apart and, and misused? Yes, um, there's a lot to work on. Um, there are a lot of examples in the Philippines, like um, one of the mountain cities where I used to work um, in Baguio City. Um, the land zoning has been a mess mm -hmm. <laughs> since um, it was um, taken over by the local government uh, after the American colonization of the Philippines. So there has been overpopulation since then, there's overdevelopment. So it's really hard to, uh, what they call this, to go back to what it used to. And it's mm. also hard to repurpose the whole city to be more sustainable or be more respectful to the indigenous peoples that have been there since, um, since before we were colonized by the different countries that colonized us. Um, so I think it will take a lot of work. And what okay. about, I was going to say, what about for the uh, people listening to us today? So the young people, what can we, do, what can people do here in Australia to help if they were passionate about that, they wanted to help um, with what's happening in the Philippines in terms of the movement to restore some of what has taken place? Are there societies that work closely um, in the Philippines that are looking, that are wanting assistance from our different countries to help in any way okay um so um i think one of the uh, organizations that we can look into for support for support is um i don't know if you know climate tracker mm -hmm. um it's an organization that uh, funds journalists and researches about environmental reportage and environmental um, coverage in the media and I think uh, if we are going to invest in them, they can help train journalists and media practitioners, not only in the Philippines, but also in other parts of the world, so that um, these kinds of issues will be properly reported, properly um, portrayed, and it will have um, deeper discussions. And because of these deep, deeper discussions, the youth and even the people residing in the Philippines and in other countries and even the government can um, realize the things that they have to do for the betterment of society and for the improvement of our treatment of the environment. And I'm just going to say to everyone that the book is an excellent book. Um, it's called Environment, Media and Popular Culture in Southeast Asia. And although it is based in that particular country, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn and take from it, especially here in Australia. We also have a complex relationship with um, our environment, and especially for us who are Indigenous, 
we also believe that the land is equal to people, that we're no more better than people. We have to coexist with the land and we have a responsibility and duty to look after the land because the land looks after us. And I think um, something, the message that I get quite clearly from you, Jason, is that we can learn a lot from the Indigenous people in the Philippines and the struggles that they've gone through and why they value so much their land is so important um, for future generations. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today, and we wish you the very best in your PhD. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. Thank you.